Hello, fellow traders, diamond handers, and future millionaires. Welcome to the next squeeze, Oatly edition. Maybe get ready because we're about to delve deep into the financial jungle of Oatly. I have combed through every nook and cranny in their latest financial report and deciphered what we need to see in the next one. I've left no stone unturned. We're talking market opportunities, global plant-based product trends, the nitty-gritty details of the short interest game. I've scoured social media. I've surfed the news waves and I caught the scent of some game-changing data that might just give us the edge we need in this trade. But hold on, we're not stopping there. We're breaking down the charts. We're deciphering the probability puzzles. We're going to even identify all those little sweet spots where risk meets reward. I've lined up the profit-taking targets that will make your portfolio sing. So grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and get ready for a roller coaster ride through Oatly's financial universe and this squeeze opportunity. In this video, we're not just skimming the surface, we're going deep. We'll dissect Oatly's recent earnings report. We'll analyze their balance sheet, the profit statements, and go through these things like nobody has done before. And I'm gonna decode the implication of their debt and revenue ratios. We are not afraid to tackle the tough questions. Short interest, days to cover, borrow rates, you name it, we're on it. And hey, we're not just here to dispel the fun. We'll explore the threats that loom over Oatly. We'll understand them properly and uncover the strategies that they might be brewing to turn the tables. And guess what? Stick around to the end because I've got a little surprise for you. I'm unveiling an alternative ticker in the consumer staple sector. This gem has a history of success, fantastic recent performance, quant ratings that will make your jaw drop. It's for those of you who are looking for a similar type of opportunity in terms of reward, maybe not looking for the same rapidity or the same extreme explosiveness over a short period of time, but you don't want the risk that comes with trading short squeezes. I've got the perfect ticker for you at the end. So if you're ready, for squeezing every single ounce of potential out of Oatly, then buckle up, apes, because we're about to embark on the next squeeze, the Oatly edition. Let's get those tendies. Let's go. What have we here? Unless you're holding the starting gun, short squeezes are all about choosing your timing and of course the right stock. I've been eyeing the profit potential in trading Oatly for a while now. In fact, many channel members will recall our call from the end of last year where we identified this entry point with an initial risk reward ratio of 3,500 to one, and the move yielded a remarkable 137% return solely with common stock. Don't say this to show off, it's to demonstrate my credibility with regards to the rest of the information we're about to now cover. Here you are presented with a relentless downtrend. Since that high, Oatly has seen a further 85% decline, lower high confluent with the downward sloping trend, which continues unabated. This is the weekly chart. You can see the danger. You know the direction it's been going. You're wise to what we're trying to do here, which is investigate the potential for this thing to squeeze, see how far it could go and get back some of that dosh from the ghouls who haunt the stock market. That's what we're going to look at now. The short interest percentage. Short interest percentage, as we can see here, 8.79% of the float, indicating a substantial number of the shares have been sold short. In an ideal short squeeze scenario, we'd like to see that short interest percentage above 10%, maybe even pushing to 20 for a crazy big move. The short interest ratio is 4.24 days to cover, suggesting it would take this many days for short sellers to close their positions 
at the current average trading volume. 4.24 days. We'd like to see that 5, 6, 7, 8 increasing. The higher the better. 8, very dangerous. 10, getting critical. So that's what we're looking for. A little bit of an increase on that figure. The way we'd interpret these two bits of data together then are that there is presently a high short interest percentage combined with a relatively low short interest ratio which suggests there is potential for a short squeeze if there's a sudden positive shift in market sentiment. Warren Buffett says that he appreciates short sellers because when they close their trade they have to buy back the stock which drives up the price. When you think about that in the context of the availability of shares to borrow is quite enlightening. If in the past there were lots of shares to borrow, that's suggestive of the fact that somebody owned those shares and had the ability to lend them in that manner, which would also then be logical to assume that they had a long-term perspective on their investment. The past trend could be indicative of the tightening scenario with regards to availability of shares and a trend evolving there. So you want to see previously more shares available to borrow than are now. We see not much of a trend here with regards to shares available to borrow. And now we look at the borrow rate, which we can see has been going up and down. The important thing to note here is the volatility intraday of the borrow rate. So if that's increasing a lot and there isn't necessarily a huge uptick in volume, then that would suggest that there is shares available to borrow. But what you want to see is the price that people have to pay changing throughout the day, a big rain. And you would like to see over a period of days that trend increasing to a higher price and higher cost to borrow. The obvious dynamic there is that anybody holding a share currently will have to start trying to get rid of those shares immediately. And it's the speaks to the corrosion of value in a short position. And this torque is what we're looking for when we're investigating a short squeeze. So these are the figures, not a strong enough trend, but indicative of something happening. I went through the rest of that website, I climbed the highest mountains, I collected all the best data and I'm going to present it to you now for your perusal. Let me know what you think of this. The conclusions and implications of all important data and ratios with regards to Oatly. Short interest percentage as we saw, 8.79% of the total float indicates a significant percentage of that float has been sold short. Short interest ratio of 4.24 days to cover is high but not critical and suggests that it could take a while for shorts to close their positions if we see changes in the underlying dynamic. A high short interest percentage combined with a relatively low short interest ratio suggests that potential trouble on the horizon. Share availability and borrow rates. The availability of the shares for shorting has varied from 150,000 to 300,000 in just two days. That's a 100% increase. So a large volatility, it's the dispersal of prices over a range. There's a large volatility in a short period of time, but that's not a new trend. Rather, it's a trend already established and in motion. Latest borrow rate, yeah, annualize that figure, it comes to 7.76%. That's not unaffordable but it is quite high. A limited availability of shares and a moderate borrowing cost indicate that short sellers might face challenges in acquiring additional shares should we see a catalyst. Off exchange short volume ratios. Oatly has a really high and consistent off exchange short volume ratio, which is partly why I'm drawn to this video and this ticker. It counts for 38 to 55% of the total volume traded of Oatly on any given day consistently hitting that top figure, 55%. And I would say that this high off exchange short volume ratio is interesting and significant because you can't tell if there's one entity acquiring shares within those dark pools, nor can you tell if there's any accumulation or distribution happening at that level on these points of data. But you can see that if there was to be a change in the underlying dynamic with regards to the availability of those shares to borrow, then you would get a spike somewhere else, which would be very revealing as to the overall narrative. 
There's also failure to deliver data because, as I say, plenty of volume off exchange, then you're going to likely see a higher degree of failures to deliver. You know, go figure, right? The data shows a history of failure to deliver consistently high on Oatly indicates complexities in trade settlement. That's how we're going to put it. Persistent failure to deliver suggests that there's potential difficulties in closing out short positions. It never makes it difficult to buy shares and this potentially increases pressure on the short position. Stock price volatility, we'll get to that in the technical analysis section, but a low of 44 cents and a high of 316 in the last year indicates that any retracement could be incredibly violent. And if we consider then the high short interest percentage, the limited availability of shares, the substantial off exchange short volume, the failure to deliver history and the moderate but volatile borrow rates Alongside this potential volatility in the stock price due to the previous yearly range, there is substantial potential for a short squeeze. I'd go as far as to say that when the degree of shares that are short on this thing do come to close, they're going to cause themselves problems. Never mind if it was to be that a group of people on the internet else got involved in that process. So a key financial highlights now coming up from the previous quarterly report from Oatly, along with what the, I would like to see in the next one, which itself is coming in just a few days. Ah, stay tuned. There's going to be more of these videos if it gets likes and attention, definitely. So if you know of somewhere you could share it, that people who would also be interested in this activity ticker or the general concept, please do share it with them. Friends, family, all welcome here. I picked apart the latest earnings report with a fine tooth comb. I went into the financial statements and gave them a trade spot and shake. And what do you know would come out but this world-class financial report on the challenges currently facing Oatly. Revenue for the six months ended June 30th, 2023, saw 391.6 million compared to 344.1 for the same period in 2022. They experienced a gross profit of 71.7 million, but that's not the full story. They faced significant operating expenses, and this is a big problem, resulting in an operating loss of 147 million for the six months 30th of June, 2023. Company's net loss for the period was 162 million. Assets and liabilities, Oatly's total assets amounted to 1.4 billion. Total liabilities, 855 million. Company has both non-current and current liabilities, including lease liabilities, convertible notes, and trade payables. Cash flows. Oatly experienced negative cash flows from operating expenses when Net cash outflow of 113.1 million, invested in intangible assets, property, plant, and equipment, incurred a net cash outflow of 38.2 million. Now, that's the cost of doing business, so that's fine. Investment activities, they're debatable. Financing activities resulted in a net cash inflow of 367.3 million, primarily from proceeds of convertible notes and liabilities to credit institutions. So, you know, good, but a bit like the curate's egg. An assessment of the financial viability and challenges facing Oatly then. Whew. Financial viability, the revenue shows a positive growth trend, which indicates market acceptance of its products. However, the company's operating expenses are high and increasing, which leads to significant losses, which are getting worse. Our ability then, well, Oatly's, to sustain these operations over the long term is a concern, given these continuous losses. We were hoping the shorts would face them, right? Challenges. High operating expenses, Oatly. You've got to get them down. What are those overheads? Especially in selling general and administrative areas. These are areas where, personally, I think they could be doing a lot better. It's a major challenge. They need to make cost efficiencies and we need to see then excellent management. Debt levels. Company has significant debt, including convertible notes and liabilities, like I said, to credit institutions who do come knocking, which increases their financial risk. They've got negative cash flows. All of this together suggests that there is the potential then for a little bit of dilution in the shares. Negative cash flows from operating activities indicate operational inefficiencies. There's no getting away from it. Impacts their liquidity, 
with the fle financial flexibility, it leads them to then higher operating expenses because their debt levels increase. So they need to fix this dynamic. The strategies they can employ to overcome these challenges, primarily they would be based in cost optimization. Oatly should focus on its operational costs, uh, especially in sales, to improve profitability and implement cost control measures so that these efficiencies become more really are realized more rapidly, which will then allow them to make the growth they need through economies of scale. They need to improve their debt management. This is terrible from a company of this size. They should evaluate debt restructuring options and they should have done it sooner and better to reduce their interest expenses. Part of the problem of course, is their HQs in Sweden. Their markets are, of course, across the world, and there's been very strong influence on their overall revenue because of the currency dynamics. Negotiating favorable terms with creditors in these conditions is very tough, so they should be doing a good job of exploring the remaining debt refinancing options available to them. Innovation and product diversification. They're doing a good job here, but they've been around for a while. Oatly should continue investing in research and development to innovate and diversify its products, expanding into new categories or enhancing existing products could drive an increase in revenue and or margins. Obviously, there's the opportunity to expand into growing markets, but where can you find them when the human development index is falling? There's a war here, there and the next place. So market expansion is an option, but it's one of various ways that you might want to grow margins. They could explore new markets and increase brand visibility to attract larger customer base, even if that is in domestic markets. Strategic marketing and partnerships then could help penetrate untapped regions. Those partnerships could be things that also lead to benefits for their supply chain optimization. It could streamline supply chain and lead to great cost savings. I think that's a massive opportunity for Oakley. Even just the suggestion of it at an earnings call would be taken well. And they can make very good efficiency savings with their inventory management too, along with negotiating certain deals with suppliers, I think, is vital. Cash flow management then could all be improved if they implement these sort of improvements, generally speaking, then a robust cash flow picture could be developed and ensure better working capital adequacy. Timely collection of receivables and efficient payment of payables is always important in any business, especially one with so many different um, aspects to the value chain as we see in food. So if they did do that, it would improve their cash flow. Investor communication. This is something that Oatly do quite a good job of in terms of their marketing. They do a great job of communication. They could also do something that's a little bit improvements with regards to how they deal with their investors. This is coming from somebody who's not yet invested in Oatly, but plan to do so as and when it reaches the areas I speak about on the chart shortly. So it's important for Oatly's management then to conduct a detailed financial review and analysis themselves along these lines. I'm sure they have done and engage with financial advisors who can give them similar advice to this. Depending on the various external factors that they perceive, they'll have different strategies in place. Success rate will depend on market dynamics, but this doesn't mean that just because the currency situation is difficult or their debt situation is extremely tight. It doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of ways they can fix it, especially if they've got a long-term perspective, which you'd need to have in the current macro environment. And in the macro environment, Oatly is placed in the consumer staples sector. These stocks are considered defensive stocks. I have videos on all of the things I've talked about today because they belong to industries that provide essential products and services that people need in their everyday life, regardless of what's going on in the general economy. And these products are basic necessities, such as food or beverages, household items, and Oatly's got lots of different product offerings within this range. The consumer staples are non-cyclical. People buy them all year. These demand then remains stable 
and it also provides that aspect of defensiveness for the stock. That stable demand, consumer staples such as food beverages, hygiene products, it's essential for daily living. So as you can see, demand stable. It provides a degree of resistance in recessions, which is obviously relevant at the minute. In times of economic recessions, spending on non-essential items tends to decline, right? So consumer discretionary sector less attractive than consumer staples. This is a direct comparison. Also, some of these stocks that are defensive provide a dividend. Oatly clearly doesn't do that, and it's worth pointing that out. Consumer, consumer staple companies often will do and have typically a strong history of a stable dividend payment. Investors often look to these stocks when they're seeking a passive income, especially during uncertain economic times. So there's a defensive nature to these type of stocks and it can, like, obviously you would consider it less sensitive to the overall fluctuations in the market then. So that's why it gives people a consideration when they think of these stocks as being less risky. Broader market indicators are experience in big declines. Consumer staples tend to weather the storm slightly better than the general stock. So you could think of them as a shield for your portfolio. If you're to look across the list of defensive stocks and consumer staples and food and put only rank it in a list, it would be near the bottom and obviously the top 300 I think it would be close to 250 to the 300. I'm not particularly enthusiastic about the fundamentals of Oatly, though I do have a comprehensive and thorough understanding of them, and I hope I've given that to you today. I would also say that you would anticipate these situations and this particular issue with the debt when you're looking at stocks which are currently experiencing a potential short squeeze, certainly a relentless downtrend as we saw on the charts to open the show. I think then, while it falls into consumer staples, we have to consider that it's a weak version of that, though we would have anticipated so. In terms of their growth and market expansion, you would be talking about the total addressable market, the TAM, and with regards to plant-based products, revenue opportunities are available in this specific market at the moment. For Oatly, it's a substantial TAM, due to the growing demand from uh, vegan diets or allergies worldwide. And we expect this trend to increase as consumers increasingly seek healthier, more sustainable alternative diets. And Oatly's product lines aligns with all of these objectives. So they could expand into new markets as these new trends evolve and grow on that total addressable market through that expansion, especially in regions with rising demand for vegan products, such as Asia and Latin America, which would provide them with a degree of growth, even if those markets, more in a macro sense, aren't exactly growing. So financial data from the company does suggest that they've got substantial cash and non-cash equivalents, but they've also got extremely high liabilities, which might make any sort of operation or exploiting those sort of opportunities quite difficult. And achieving profitability then in a strong dollar environment is tough for every company outside of America. Tell me about it. And in conclusion, their financial data, it highlights challenges, but we all know that with the right leader, that's an opportunity. Now we've reached the section all serious traders have been waiting for. We're going to the charts because it's where we make our money. We're going to define best places to enter, good times, and where we think we'll take profit. Keep an eye on the risk. Back to where we first began. This is the weekly chart. We saw it earlier. Price has no history at these current levels, so we must use other factors to determine the potential support areas below. That channel that contained price action from the IPO in May 2021 to the call in December 2022 gives us a diagonal level where price may react should it meet along with an important horizontal. We can see where this diagonal intersects with a Fib extension on the next chart. This is the daily for Oatly. It shows price reaching beyond the 2.72 extension 
of the recent low to high and approaching the 50% level of the trend-based FIB extension from the previous low to high in this trend. We can then anticipate a further 15 to 30% drop without price finding any support on the way down to 0.36 or 0 spot 3. The data allows us to define an area of risk where if price reaches beyond these levels, then you might not want that trade because you could enter a game lower and not absorb the loss. The trend has been and continues to be bearish, extremely so, but then there are conditions that give way to a short squeeze and that would be these. The most recent lows show there is no bullish divergence, never mind the three touches we would like to see. There is no bottoming formation. There has been no reversal. There is no current sign of an imminent support-based reaction on technical artifacts we can rely on. I would aim, though, then, both, to get my stop as close to my entry as possible, scale into position, and limit my position size until the move goes in my favour. There is, though, something interesting that speaks to the starting point of opportunity in Oatly as potentially being imminent, the RSI, Extremely oversold levels, even for a trend as extreme and consistent as Oatly's has been. I use this little special trade spot and trick in these scenarios. I identify the FIB extension of the previous low on the RSI and I use it to time a short term reversal. I think we saw one of those on the charts today. If I time it correctly, this allows me to enter a position as price reacts. Then using risk management techniques in combination with the execution methods that I teach on my course, links below, I can immediately reduce my potential loss to zero. This is a great skill to have when you're trying to time entries for volatile stocks, especially short squeeze moves, as it gives you the chance at multiple opportunities to take that trade without increasing your cost basis. And this does wonders for your risk reward over time. In this instance, we see the RSI extremely oversold and the 1.13 extension of the previous low. To be clear, trend and momentum are both very bearish, so much so that they can't get much worse. And as a trader, I look first for continuation, then for weakness in the data. My reading of the charts is that shorts will soon be closing or covering, and if this comes with new market entrants, prices could explode to the top side. For take profit targets, I use the Rocky Outcrop Flash. This is a proprietary black box indicator, works on all assets. It was invented by my brother. He worked at the investment bank with me, 20 years experience as a trader, runs a community of hundreds of others, myself included, and people just like you get full access to his suite of indicators. I use his toolkit, his RSI and others. Get that full access on the premium side of his Discord alongside that. All on his Patreon. I recommend selecting the indicator tier. Rock Outcrop Flash shows us in this instance that price will likely hit and react at the following price targets. On the three minute chart, you can see some targets there. We've got 65 cents, zero spot 65. That's a 44% increase. 0 spot 84, that would be an 88% increase. $1.40, that's a 215% target to the top side. And then $1.60, a 257% move that would represent. That's because of the Rocky Outcrop flashes we've got across the time frames. Three minute, one hour, 15 minute chart. The one minute also gives us a rocky outcrop flash that we can use to define our risk reward. We use this initial target along with prices at their current levels and all of our data to place our stop at an acceptable level that meets a success rate that works out for us over time. Join Rocky's Patreon and get access to the indicator and check that one minute out for yourself there. So I have defined my trade and how I would approach price action based on the current artifacts. It could, of course, go a whole lot lower. And if it doesn't hold those support levels I mentioned, I'd be looking at potentially another 50, 60% off. I'll be entering shortly and managing my risk 
so that I'll be able to take multiple bites at this cherry. Target in 0 spot 48. Get my stop into profit. If the trade works out, first video gets some traction. I'll make lots more follow up videos on Oatly. Be happy to do so. Ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, diamond handers, paper handers, and everybody in between. I have a fantastic opportunity for you. I believe in you and I believe in this ticker. Tell me the first thing that jumps out at you from this chart. Is it price meeting the 200 period moving average? with itself below the 50 simple period moving average with price in an uptrend? Is it that this retracement here comes back down to a 236 and a 200 period moving average as we see positive earnings? Is it the uptrend? Is it the fact that there is a cycle of higher highs and higher lows? Is it the nascent and relative new aspect to this chart? Is it that you saw the ticker? You looked down and saw it was the Vita Coco Company and you thought there's similarities there between Oatly and the Coco Company that they both focus on what seem to be environmentally friendly and healthy products. There is big distinctions though, namely in price. This thing has been moving to the top side and continues to do so at a relentless pace. It's got fantastic profitability. The company's really re well run. It's really well managed and it has been since inception. They've got fantastic marketing efforts which are aligned with their brand objectives. But Vita Coco company sponsor athletes and sportsmen. They then advertise the benefit of the healthy energy aspects to their drinks which allows the Vita Coco company to go from big packaged lower margin products to smaller in the fridge take and go coconut products which is a far higher margin, a far, far higher frequency purchase, much bigger market share, and gets your brand much bigger visibility. And Vita Coco Company are fantastic at doing that, whereas Oatly, not so much. They do not advertise the energy benefits of their products. They do not place them for regular purchases every day throughout the day. They do not properly make the most of that opportunity and it's a partly a problem to do with their branding because they focus far too much on how it's environmentally sustainable as opposed to it being good for you the consumer and the consumer only cares about themselves and you're consuming this right now so i hope you've remembered to hit the like button the vita coco company we're looking at the daily time frame prices testing the 236 the 200 period moving average the horizontal level of support which was a prior high from the previous trend if this thing is to continue moving to the top side then the best possible time to buy it are during huge retracement wicks like this one or this one but even better this one because it comes subsequent to this guy which is higher than this guy which defines this as an uptrend and that's the direction you continue to expect price to go when it's been put in informations like this fantastic fantastic trade that's the daily time frame on the weekly spread out the 50 simples down at 2151 so it could drop another four bucks and 20 cents that would be a massive opportunity. It hasn't tested that since it went through it and created a 200, the, the new a higher high. We're waiting for a 200 period moving average to show up on the weekly. When it does, price will go there. On to the daily time frame, back where we came from, 50 simple at rejection so far at 26.83. You bake above 26.83, you'll go up, you'll test $30. That's an extra five on something that costs 25 at the minute. That's a huge percentage increase. And then you'll see up at 32. 33 bucks testing this previous high when it breaks that then you'll go on you probably want to take profit at some point reasonable point and that's a huge percentage move i think 34 dollars 50 is a good place to look to then 38 and then 40 bucks on the vita coco company 40 bucks on something that costs 25 at the minute and there's no need to rely on idiosyncratic aspects to the stock market it'll probably happen in a fashion in line with this previous trend and then you would be able to expect it sometime in around next summer or christmas if the stock market doesn't completely collapse and it's super easy to judge that because it's got a whole chart all of its own so the vita coco company on the weekly the daily and then down to the four hour time frame remind you about that positive earnings you've had 200 period moving average has the 50 simple cross below it and what's happened since then 
Price actions moved up 10%, created a gap back above a 236, opening and closing above the 50 simple, testing that 200 and the potential death cross in the four hour. And now, if price moves back above 26, well, 80, and find support there, that might be the entry that people who really is risk averse yet still have adaptations for trading to that mentality might be desperately after this sort of opportunity where this already confirmed that this was a local low, it's in an uptrend and it's moving on to higher highs. You might be looking for a $26 entry. If instead you like an awful lot of chocolate on your biscuit, then you're thinking we'll just buy it in at around 21 if it ever gets there. If it doesn't, there's plenty of other opportunities. And those people who are compelled by this thing in front of them and want to make the most of what's going on right now will be looking at tests of that 50 simple at 25 and change where we're at at the minute. They'll be looking at price action today to see if it slips back down and breaks below 24.50 because that was the prior month's low. And if it does, they'll be a little bit cautious of this potential leg of the trend being a downtrend and prices come back down to 20 bucks or that entry at 21. So you'd be looking at that, judging your risk areas. And I can tell you they're pretty obvious here. You do not want to drop below 23.80. You definitely would like to hold 24.50. If all of those break, you've got a great opportunity at 21 bucks. If you don't get it, you don't want it below 20. And then if it goes back above 26, the trend could be onto the top side. You could be making loads of money. And boom! And I'll tell you, I'll make your portfolio sing. Check it out. There's also a video guide on how to identify and exploit these opportunities for yourself. If you like a lot of chocolate on your biscuit, join our club. If you're serious about trading, Take my course. If you want to see more of those videos, let me know below. Boom. That's a great video.